Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draw odds are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash Insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. All in all, if you're hunting out West in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin. We're heading out to Pennsylvania land, at least the East Coast, where they're buried with snow. And uh, Kristen Berg, the editor of Peterson's Bowhunting Magazine, is our guest today. Good morning, Christian. Uh, good morning, Bruce. Uh, glad to be with you here. It's day three of spring here in Pennsylvania, and we celebrate, celebrated day two of spring with a foot of snow yesterday. So I uh, got my driveway cleaned up, uh, made it out of the house this morning, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Well, Guy, um, I, I live out in Colorado, and, um, you know, it's going to be 70 out here today. Well, something seems backwards about that. It seems like Colorado should have the snow. And we should have spring weather. You can see the turkey fans behind me. I keep saying I'm ready for turkey season, you know, but Mother Nature doesn't want to cooperate. It's certainly not. And, folks, we're in for a treat today because Christian, you know, has done a lot and uh, in the outdoor industry, in the media industry. And also he hunts a little bit here and there, as you can see uh, behind him. So let's start right off with your 2017 uh, season. You, you had some good hunts and uh, they came out pretty good. Yeah, Bruce, you know, um, you know, I think as hunters, we all tend to run, you know, hot and cold sometimes. You know, sometimes you, you have a year and it feels like just nothing goes your way. And certainly I've had my fair share of those. And then you have some years where you're like, man, I just can't do anything wrong. And fortunately for me, uh, 2017 was one of those years where I was like, I couldn't do anything wrong. Um, started out uh, down in Kentucky in September. And, you know, being a whitetail guy and obviously having a podcast that focuses on whitetails, a lot of your listeners probably know, but maybe some don't, um, you know, velvet whitetails are kind of a rare trophy in the hunting world because there's not that many places where you can kill whitetail bucks in velvet. I know, you know, the Western guys kill a lot of velvet mule deer every year, but if you want a velvet whitetail, particularly here in the eastern half of the country, Kentucky is pretty much about the only game in town because I know, I think Wyoming and maybe the Dakotas, Montana, they might open up early enough in, in September to get some whitetails in velvet or even in August. But here in the East, you got to go to Kentucky if you want to get one. And so they have an early September opener. You got about a 10 day window before all those bucks are going to strip out. And, uh, you know, it's funny, this hunt actually dated back to 2015. I went down uh, to Kentucky and I hunted at a place called Whitetail Heaven Outfitter. They're just south of Lexington, Kentucky in the bluegrass country like thoroughbred horse country, really, really beautiful area, um, rolling hills, big horse farms, a lot of white picket fences, um, some agriculture, and some nice hardwoods, too. I didn't kill a buck on that hunt, but while I was down there, Bruce, I saw um, about 10 or 12 other clients that were there that week kill some great velvet bucks. I mean, some really impressive gear. Matter of fact, there was a guy from Louisiana while I was there, who rolled into camp one night with a 202 inch. No point. way. Yes, oh, my goodness. I, I kid you not. A, a free range, fair chase, 202 inch deer. So, and 
and I saw some nice bucks myself that week, but I just didn't get a shot. So needless to say, I was impressed with the operation down there at Whitetail Heaven, and I really wanted to get back. But because of my schedule, I mean, you know, you probably do a bunch of hunts. I usually have a bunch of hunts booked out sometimes a year or two in advance. I just wasn't able to get back in 2016. So it took me two years to finally get back this past September, went back down to Whitetail Heaven. And on the second day of my hunt, I had an opportunity to kill a giant whitetail on my own. Not quite a 200 incher, but a big non-typical buck. Had 13 points. Um, he ended up scoring 181 and 3 eighths gross. Yeah, he had a, a unicorn point coming out of the base of his right brow tine. He had a split G3 on his right side. Just a really, really cool looking buck. So that was an, an incredible way to start out the year. Um, was the biggest buck that I had ever killed personally at that time. And to make matters even better, I had a cameraman with me. We recorded that whole hunt for Bowhunter TV, which will be on the Sportsman channel. Matter of fact, that episode is going to air on Bowhunter TV uh, the week of April 2nd. So that's coming up here in just, uh, what, about two weeks. Yep. I think that show's going to be uh, on, the, on the channel. So people can check it out there. And uh, so, so really, again, a, a huge thrill. But then, so then I'm thinking too, you know, if you kill a buck like that, first week of September, you're like, man, the pressure's off, right? I mean, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I even see a deer the rest of the fall. Uh, you know, my season is made, certainly. Uh, but ended up uh, having really good luck. I actually went out to South Dakota uh, in, in October. I killed, uh, you know, just a just a small eight pointer out there. Nice, nice deer, but not not a real big buck. And then later in October, I killed another nice buck here at home in Pennsylvania. So now I've killed three bucks. And then in early November, I actually head out to Kansas. I had been invited by a buddy of mine, John Baca, who's the pro staff coordinator at Vista Outdoors. So that's Bushnell, Primos, Gold Tip, a bunch of companies, you know, that people would be familiar with. John's got a lease out there, and he had invited me to come out and hunt with him on his lease. Well, I get out there in early November. Actually, I, I don't remember if it was the 4th or 5th of November, but I flew out to Kansas City, got a rental car. I drove about another four hours out to uh, a little town called Great Bend, Kansas. It's out in the middle of the state. I don't know if you, you're in Colorado, so you, I'm sure you've spent some time in Kansas. I don't get out to that part of the country real often, but, you know, typical prairie country. I mean, it's just flat out there and, and not a lot going on there in the middle of Kansas. But I get to the Best Western Hotel uh, there in Great Bend, Kansas, and I meet up with John, and, it, and we're talking, um, you know, the night before that we're going to start hunting. He says, now listen, he says, it's a full moon this week. He says, usually out here, we really don't hunt in the morning when it's a full moon because we just don't think they move that well. So he said, what we'll probably do tomorrow, he said, let's, let's go ahead and sleep in, maybe get up around nine o'clock, walk across the street, have some breakfast at Denny's. And, uh, you know, we'll get you out stand maybe 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. I thought, hey, man, this is this is even, you know, Kansas hunt. I was excited. This is even better. I don't even have to get up early. You know? I'm like, hey, man, if that's what you do, I'm not going to tell you how to hunt when I'm coming out to hunt with you. So we'll do whatever you want to do. So that's what we do. We get up. We go over to breakfast. Well, here John has got, and you know, you talk about technology. You know, podcasts like this are great. Technology is such a such a great tool. John, John picks out his phone out of his pocket while we're having breakfast. He's got some of these Bushnell trail cameras with the wireless technology in them. And so he checks his trail cameras that are over at the farm while we're having breakfast. And here's this picture of this giant buck that's working the edge of this shelter belt at 2.30 in the morning. He's right in front of this one stand. And he shows me this picture. He's like, hey, Christian, you know, he shows me his phone. Look at this. Look at this buck. And I'm like, holy moly. He said, I think you ought to get in that stand today. I said, he's working that scrape line. Uh, you know, and you, ought, I, I think I'm going to put you in that stand. So anyway, we get over there. I get in the stand about 11 o'clock uh, in the morning. And I'm not in the stand. I don't know. Maybe I was in there an hour or so. And I, I hear something over to my right, and I turn, and here comes this buck, and it's this buck, and he's coming. Right no way. Through, right through the trees behind me, and I reach over to get my bow off the hanger, and as I'm getting the bow off my hanger, the buck must have seen me move. He looks over, and he turns around, and boom, he runs out into 
the alfalfa field and takes off. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I was like, I can't believe you just screwed that up. Oh, I'm like, no. you blew it. And then I'm just standing there and I'm beating myself up. And I'm like, you know what? I was like, just calm down because maybe you didn't really spook them as bad as you think you did. Because, you know, and again, being from the East here, I'm used to big, big woods. And I don't know where you hunt, but you know in Kansas where there's like huge, in front of me was an alfalfa field that was several hundred acres. And behind me was a cattle pasture that was probably several hundred acres. And I was sitting in this little shelter belt that's several, probably about 300 yards long and about 40 yards deep. And that was the only cover in the area. I mean, when we first got over there, I was like, where's the woods? He's like, ah, there's no woods. And, and the other funny thing is, he's like, don't worry. He's like, there's a lot of deer. They hold in this shelter belt. And the other funny thing was, I'm in this ladder stand. He shows me the ladder stand, and it's like eight feet tall. And I'm like, you can't kill a deer out of this ladder stand. I'm like, I mean, look at this thing. And he just, John's funny. He says, he's like, oh, don't worry. He's like, the deer out here, they don't really look up. And so I'm like, okay, well, in Pennsylvania, the deer look up. I mean, they're used to being hunted hard. No, but it is it is a little different because really, I mean, I'll actually throw a statistic at you. I, I did some research for a program that I was doing. Just as a quick aside, do you realize that in Pennsylvania, we've got about 970,000 deer hunters and we kill about 150,000 bucks every year. So you can calculate what that success rate is, 150,000 bucks for 970,000 hunters. That's just bucks. It doesn't include antlers here. And we've got about 45,000 square miles the size of, is, a, is the size of our state. Well, do you know in Kansas, they've got fewer than a quarter as many hunters, and they kill fewer than a quarter as many bucks every year. And the size of Kansas is almost twice the size of Pennsylvania. So sometimes when you want to know why the hunting is so much better in one place than it is another, all you have to do is look at cover. If I could get rid of three out of every four of my fellow hunters who are competing against with me, and I could spread those fewer number of hunters out across an area that was almost twice the size, think about the change in the quality. We're just packed on top of each other in Pennsylvania. We've got a lot of hunters, and we lead the, the nation in hunter density. So anyway, as an aside, you know, it's just nice to be able to go somewhere where there's more deer and fewer hunters, it really changes the quality of the experience. Make a long story short, at about 3 o'clock that afternoon, here comes a spike buck out in the alfalfa field walking along the edge of the tree line, and not 30, 40 yards behind this spike buck comes this buck again, this giant buck that we had seen on the camera. And I had hung a, a little scent wick with some estrus doe urine on, on There were straight kind of out both directions from my stand, one to my right and one to my left, and I had hung two scent wicks up. This buck comes along the edge of the tree line, stops at that straight, sniffs the scent wick, you know, starts digging up dirt right on that straight there, and then ends up coming out right in front of my tree, about 27 yards, and he's eating out in the field in front of me, and I end up shooting this buck. He runs about 80 yards and dies, and this buck scores almost 184 gross. I think I, I taped him out of 183 and six days. So I had to hunt two days in Kentucky to kill a 181. And then I had to hunt not even one full day in Kansas to kill a 184. And those are the only two 180 inch bucks I have ever killed in my entire life. So I've kind of been nervous now, as exciting as 2017 was, I kind of feel like the deer gods are going to make me pay for that, Bruce. And I don't even know if I'm going to see a deer in 20. So why why buy a tag? You know, you might as well not even buy a tag. I should probably tell my wife that I'm just going to go grocery shopping with her this fall. I'm not going to do any hunting. Yeah. (laughs) No, I don't think so. I'm going to go. I got to do it. I got to try, you know. I figure, you know, I'm either going to get get some more big ones or I'm going to have some fun trying. You know what I mean? Well, let's give a shout out to Whitetail Heaven. I think it's Tevis McCauley out there, isn't it? Yeah, Tevis. Yeah, you know Tevis. Tevis. I, I... had, I talked to him when I first started the show, and I haven't uh, had the opportunity to get out there. Some of my friends from Trees and Camo um, guide out there for him. Oh, he's yeah. got an awesome, really cool. awesome operation. Yeah. And he's got the three-state combo. You can do his three-state Grand Slam, and, uh, you know, the accommodations are anything. So uh, for yep. Tevis, as a, as, go ahead. As a matter of fact, in addition to that TV show that's going to air next month, I wrote an article about the hunt that's going to be in the June issue of Peterson. And I tell the whole story of how Tevis got started. He's an interesting character. He's only 33 years 
old. And he started guiding deer hunts when he was 18. So he's already been in business like 16 years. And like you said, he's grown from, you know, just having that one family farm where he started doing hunts. They've got now 50,000 acres, like you said, in Kentucky, uh, Ohio, and Indiana. Uh, it really is a, an impressive operation. He operates three different lodges, and uh, the guy's kind of a, kind of amazing with how far he's come at such a young age. So there's, there's probably, there's some free shout out for you. Well deserved. Yeah, though. he owes you a hunt now, Bruce. I'm going to hunt you. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh. Macaulay, if you're listening, look at my fingertip right now. You get this <laughs> man, this man right here, you get him down and show him some of your deer. That's it, Bruce. You're in. I'm you're in, in. I'm in. Thank you so much. <laughs> Kristen, I don't know what I could do without you. I, I know where I could get in trouble with you, probably. Well, we ought to go down there together. and, 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 and <laughs> That would be happen. a hoot. Yeah, that would be a hoot. Let, let's switch it back up. You, you mentioned two things last year, 2017. Um, one, you were on private land. Two, you were hunting with people that knew the, what the heck was going on in their land. But three, statistically, to get 180 plus, even a 150 plus, forget, forget that, going all the way to Pope and Young, 120-ish plus deer is statistically is is out of sight. You talk about uh, Pennsylvania and their hunt and how many deer and how many, you know, per hundred per square mile and deer versus deer per square mile. You talk about all that, but in the warm up, we talked about uh, the subject, the mature deer uh, reality. So let's dive into that. You get some good data that we, that we talked about earlier. So I'd like to throw that out to the people to get, just get real with your expectations. Oh yeah. You know, the genesis of this whole conversation about, you know, buck size and, and, you know, what we ought to realistically expect as hunters goes back to a, a meeting that I had with my friend Jason Snavely uh, back earlier this uh, in the winter, last winter. Jason's my whitetails columnist. He, he's a fellow Pennsylvania guy, but he, he owns a company called Drop Pine Wildlife Consulting. And he's got clients, you know, all around the country and he helps folks you know, manage their properties to improve the, the quality of the wildlife habitat and, you know, sort of as uh, a result of that, the quality of the deer, you know, on their property. And Jason had gone to Mississippi State University and uh, some really interesting research coming out of there. So anyway, I was talking with Jason. We were having lunch. We were talking about different things that we could address through his whitetails column this year. And Jason said to me, you know, one thing that I'd really like to talk about is, you know, managing our expectations as hunters when it comes to bucks. Because, you know, it's whether you turn on the TV or you get on the internet, it's like there's 180 inch deer behind every tree, right, Bruce? I mean, everybody's killing 180 inch deer. All you got to do is turn on the outdoors. Um, but you and I both know, and this is coming from a guy who killed two 180s this year, right? But as I said, those are the only two I've ever killed in my life. And I may live, I'm 44. I may live another 44 years and never kill another one, right? Because right. the truth of the matter is most bucks aren't 180s and they're never going to be 180s. And so Jason wrote this really interesting column. And in the column, he talked about some research that was just recently put out from his former advisor down at Mississippi State University. And what he did, this professor and some of his students, is they monitored uh, the antler size and score as it correlates to the age of the buck in the Mississippi Delta region. So that the area of Pennsylvania, uh, Mississippi where it's the most fertile soils, where you have the biggest, best buck hunting in the state. And what they found is that at three and a half years old, the average buck in Mississippi only had a rack that would score about 121 inches. And even at five and a half, and I got to look over here, at five and a half, that number only went up to 136 inches, okay? So you're looking at three and a half year old bucks on average, just barely making Pope and Young. And even if you let those bucks live another two years to five and a half, they're still not quite to 140. And so that just goes to show you that by and large, you know, your average white tail buck is never going to be a, a 180, not going to be a, even a 150. I think he had something in there uh, at three and a half, uh, forget what it was, but it was like single digit percent, like 4% or something like that to get to 150 at three and a half. You know, and at five and a half, it might be a little bit more. But the point is, genetically speaking, even at full maturity, the average buck is going to be somewhere between 130 and 140 inches. And the other thing is that your, your reality 
as a deer hunter, right, is somewhat dictated by your geography. So for you there in Colorado, for me here in Pennsylvania, when I go out to hunt whitetails here at home, and I still passionately hunt whitetails here, right, this is where I started, this is where I'll always hunt, but when I go out here around home, I don't go out thinking I'm going to shoot a 180 or a 150 or even a 140. I'm just looking for a three and a half year old buck because I know the pressure is high. And if I can get a three and a half year old buck that scores 120 inches, I'm going to be thrilled. You know, and I think that most hunters are or should be, you know, thrilled with that because those truly big bucks, unless you're hunting in places like Kansas or Kentucky that not only have the right genetics and the right habitat, then on top of that, you've got to exercise some trigger control, right? Whether that's gun hunting or bow hunting, you've got to limit the harvest. You've got to have all those things. If you're not going to have the right genetics, the right habitat, and a limited harvest, you're just not going to see numbers of deer that size. So it's unrealistic to expect that we can grow enough, you know, truly trophy-sized deer to satisfy all the deer hunters of America. Yeah, and I'm just going to throw up, uh, throw up, throw in um, from what QDMA ha- had reported in their um, whitetail reports for this year, that they're seeing a trend upwards from instead of browning down to two and a half year old deer and, and bucks, you know, being killed. And, it, and it's starting to grow because a lot of people are saying, hey, you know, um, let them go and let them grow because of people like yourself and, and podcasters and all the TV channels, the YouTube channels that people are shooting these larger bucks and you got to take that into context. I don't know how many people are in the outdoor media industry. I'm going to say a hundred thousand. Well, a lot of them hunt five or six different states a year as you do that. I typically hunt three different states. So the odds kind of come in my favor that I've hunted, Bo, uh, hunted Buffalo County in Wisconsin, which is, has a extremely high rate of success for, you know, Boone and Crockett bucks. And I've seen two Boone and Crockett bucks. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. And, and 60 yards away was the closest, the mahogany buck. I, I didn't get him. Gorgeous buck. I hunted him hard. And uh, maybe that's why I didn't get him. But I saw him at 60 yards and had no shot. That that's the closest I ever got to him. And he was a gorgeous, you know, gorgeous, gorgeous buck. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example. There's a place uh, that I hunt in Illinois every year. Some a wonderful family. Uh, that owns owns an outfitter called River Bottom Bucks. And I've probably hunted there now seven or eight years. And I've killed, you know, some nice bucks. But only one of the bucks that I've ever killed out there, you know, reached into the 160s. You know, I've, I've got a bunch of, you know, 130 class bucks out there. Um, because the really, really big ones, you know, there's just only so many of them, even in a great area. Now, on the flip side of the coin, as you said, Bruce, the hunting is better now. I think across the board, I think it, I think generally speaking, if we said, you know, just purely in terms of, of antler size, I think we're kind of in a golden age of deer. Um, I can say certainly here in Pennsylvania, if you'd get on the Pennsylvania Game Commission website and look up uh, the trophy record for deer, you're going to see that an awful lot of the top 10 entries for whitetails both typical and non-typical, have come in during the 2000s. You know, a lot of record book bucks have come in because, as you said, you know, people are, you know, starting to let some of these younger deer grow. So so those those deer, even though they're outliers, right, I mean, you know, every deer isn't going to be a 170, a 180, but some of those really good young deer that have great potential, they are making it, you know, from three and a half to four and a half, five and a half, and then, you know, you're seeing, you know, what's possible there. And then as more of that happens, every single one of those deer is like a brick in the wall, right, Bruce? As we're building, we're building this case. And so as hunters collectively, we're, we're realizing what the potential is and what happens when that potential is realized. And so I think it feeds on itself. You know, a few people exercise, a little trigger control, and then a couple more big bucks get shot. And then more people exercise trigger control, and you just keep climbing that ladder. And QGMA, they have a lot of research and data on uh, age class recruitment. That's what we're talking about here, folks. And the only way you're going to get big bucks in your land, on your land, no matter where you are, is then you just have to make that decision between everybody. Now, if you have a kid, a first time hunter, it doesn't matter. You know, go out and hunt, and if the deer can buy, shoot them. I'm I'm all for that. But if you put a couple of deer in the ground and you want to see big deer, other people don't. They want to hunt for the freezer, put, you know, 
food on the, the table, great. It, it's your land. Enjoy your hunt. It, it's your trophy. Uh, but on the other hand, if you, if you want to, you know, get that age class recruitment to get those five and a half year old deer to see what your property can produce. And that's the other thing people get mesmerized with. Maybe yeah. your property cannot produce that. Go ahead. Well, you know, I'm going to give you a little saying that's very applicable here. Um, my wife is in, is in uh, the sales business. And one little mantra that we use all the time with people on her sales team, but it's perfectly applicable to us as deer owners. And it's this, if you, if you want something that you've never had, you've got to do something that you've never done. And so as deer hunters, if you want what you already have, then just keep doing everything the way that you've always done it. And so, like you said, if people, you know, hunt somewhere and they're shooting, you know, smaller deer and that makes them perfectly happy or they just want meat for the freezer, then that's perfectly fine. You know, I'm not here to judge anybody today and I don't think that you are either. But on the other hand, if you're shooting, you know, relatively modest sized bucks, but your desire is to shoot bigger deer or to be able to just maybe have some bigger deer to hunt, then the only way to do that, right, is you've got to stop shooting the smaller ones to get the bigger ones. If you want something you've never had, you got to do something you've never done before. And maybe that thing that you've never done is to start to let those younger deer reach the older age class, you know. And if you hunt somewhere like Pennsylvania, that can be a real challenge because while I might choose to do that, I know that there are a lot of other hunters, you know, across top property boundaries that are only a couple hundred yards away from my tree stand who may or may not choose to exercise the same restraint. And that can be, you know, at times a source of frustration for people like me. And and that is an, um, uh, a question that everybody has to uh, wrestle with their own mind. What's my relationships with my neighbors? Do I understand what their hunting goals are? And then once you understand that, because George and Mary across the fence own that, they can do whatever they darn well please, no matter how many food plots you put in, how much land management you do, it doesn't matter. George and Mary are going to do what they want in the kids, in the and the grandkids or whatever. So you have to understand that. And that's a caveat that when you're doing your land management program, I've been told by Land and Legacy, there's uh, John O'Brien, there's a lot of great people out there doing it. You have to understand what their goals are because if you don't, then you're going to spend a lot of money and not get the ROI, you know, uh, return on investment. Yeah, you know, and the thing is, as much as we, as much as we love to see those big bucks on our trail cameras and we get so excited about them, no matter how many, I don't care if you have 10,000 trail camera pictures of the same buck, guess what? He's not your buck. He doesn't belong to anybody and he's just as liable to walk across the fence and get shot by the neighbor as he is by you. And uh, gosh, you can eat your heart out sometimes uh, when that sort of thing happens. But the other thing that I've been encouraged by here in Pennsylvania, and I have, um, you know, when I speak to groups of hunters, I've got trail camera pictures to show this. There was a particular deer just this past year in my area who lived to be six and a half years old. He was finally killed at six and a half this past fall. And I bet you he weighed about 300 pounds on the hook. Probably scored in the high 130s, but the body size on this buck was just unbelievable. It was a big, nine, it was a big um, 11 point. And uh, he only added the 11th point just this past year at six and a half. He was a 10-pointer, and we watched him. So 2017, 16, 15, 14. We had four years of trail camera pictures of this buck. And even with the intense hunting pressure in my area, this buck managed to survive. And it was neat how over the years we kind of pieced together the pattern of where this buck would spend the summers and where he'd kind of go in the fall during hunting season. And what I do in sharing this with other people and showing these photos, um, and then the harvest photo as well. Um, matter of fact, I've got these. Can I hold these up for your camera? Yeah, sure. I happen to have these right here. Okay. Can I can I share the story? Yeah, sure. Okay. You're so, good. So this is the buck. Okay, at two and a half years old. Can you see the buck? Yep. Okay, and that's that's uh, July of 2014. A great young uh, two and a half year old ten point. Okay. Now in 2015. Oh, and, and I. I would have probably been tempted to kill him that year. He was a really nice deer. Now, now here's the same buck in 2015, okay? And there you can get a, a decent look at him. He's looking pretty good in 2015. That was taken in September of 2015, okay? Now, we all wanted to kill him that year, but he never, nobody ever saw this deer in daylight, by the way. Nobody ever saw this buck. Now, now But the trail cameras are in daylight. Well, just that, well, the first two. Now, right. oh wait, now right. I'm going to show you, okay? Now, that was 14 and 15. 
But uh, yeah, that one was. Now here in September of 2016, here he is in September of 2016. He's looking pretty good now, isn't he? Yes. Okay. Now, now, I mean, that's a great looking buck. Now we never saw this year. Nobody ever saw this year during hunting season. Now here's a picture from August 27th of last year. Here's a picture from August 27th of 2017. Look how big he's looking now. Look at the body size. Look at the the, the sway in his back and the big sagging belly and those giant front shoulders. I mean, what a great buck. There he is. And then, so finally, and again, I tell you, over the course of this whole four years, nobody ever saw this deer. Well, here I'm going to show you a picture. During the second week of rifle season here in Pennsylvania, it was a Thursday afternoon, this buck finally chased a doe out into a food plot guy who has a food plot just over the hill from where I hunt through the valley and, and up the base of the next mountain. Wait till I show you this picture and tell me how fat this deer was. Look at oh this my buck. goodness. Look at this buck, okay? How do you look put it on that buck. much weight in a I year? And look at I mean the rack I mean the rack is nice, but he's not like from just a pure antler standpoint, he's not an absolute giant, right? But look at that body size. He's an absolute hog. And so this is what I say and this is why I share this story is when you see a deer, okay, I ask everybody, I'm asking all of your listeners right now, okay, have you ever, even one time in your entire hunting life, seen a buck coming towards your tree stand, and the first thing that comes into your mind is, if I don't kill this buck, somebody else is going to, right? Raise your hand if you've ever had that thought. Bruce, are you guilty? I'm guilty, right? Okay, guilty, guilty as charged. And here's, and here's where, why I go, if, if the first thought that you have when you see a buck in the field is, if I don't kill that deer, somebody else is going to, and I'm going to guarantee you one thing. That's not the buck that you were hoping to see when you got up in the morning. A buck that makes you think that is like this marginal buck that's like almost maybe big enough for you to shoot, but you're not quite sure, but you're worried about what George and Mary are going to do if it walks across the fence line. And so what I tell everyone is, look, if you shoot that deer, okay, if I would have shot that deer in 2014, or 2015, or 2016, you know what would have happened, Bruce? He would have been dead. If I shot him, he would have been dead. But if I don't shoot that deer, and I let him go, George and Mary may or may not kill him, or he may live. And what this deer has taught us in our little area of Pennsylvania is that if we let these deer go, they actually are smart enough, they're savvy enough, they're wise enough, they're scared enough, whatever you want to call it. They have the ability, even in an area with intense hunting pressure, to survive year after year after year. And so when you see a deer that you're thinking, eh, maybe I ought to shoot this. You know, if I don't shoot this, George and Mary are, are going to shoot it. Don't give in to the temptation of that way of thinking. Hey, let George and Mary have their chance. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. If you shoot it, it's dead. But if you don't shoot it, you may be rewarded with an opportunity to kill a buck like that in a few years. And that, my friends, right there, I don't care whether you're in Pennsylvania or Kansas or anywhere, that is a true trophy and a deer of a lifetime for lots and lots of deer hunters. Certainly, I would have been absolutely thrilled to have killed that. So, I, I think um, that's my soapbox. Bruce. I think you did well. I think I think you need to write a blog or, or get an article, uh, you know, on that. I know I don't know if you've done that from the stage at some of the seminars you do, but that that's a good message. I mean, you can put that on YouTube, and we just did it in you know five, six, seven minutes, but. That's something that people to think about uh, as a tradition. You know, Wisconsin's a huge nine-day season gun hunt tradition, and we killed hundreds of thousands of deer, a deer uh, during those nine days. But it's a tradition. I know guys that never take their gun out of their gun case when they go up north. They never do. And they say, hey, I'm going deer hunting. Well, then they never go hunting. Why? Because it's the tradition to sit around, play euchre, have a beer, have not a beer or whatever, but just talk to friends and, and family and, and, and take out the new kids. I mean, that's the hunting tradition, and that's what I'd like to share. You take the hunting tradition and you take the growing of big bucks and, and seeing your land develop and the deer develop. That's why I hunt. I mean, that, that, that's it. Yeah, and I mean, that comes with time, doesn't it, Bruce? Yes. You know, that's a whole other discussion, but all the stages of a sportsman. And when, you know, when we when we were younger and we were just getting into it, you know, the most important thing was to just get a shot at a deer, right? It didn't matter how big the deer was. And, and then after a while, it was, you know, just challenging ourselves. So for me, it was, you know, getting away from the gun and picking up the bow. And, of course, I've spent, you know, 
most of my adult life, you know, as a passionate bow hunter, uh, you know, and that kind of becomes a thing. And, and now as a father, you know, I, I don't know if you have kids, Bruce, uh, you have kids, you have grandkids. I mean, right now my, my boys are 12 and 14 and it's kind of become all about them. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm glad I have this job and I get to travel to some of these other states because I hardly ever get to go hunting by myself in Pennsylvania anymore. Pretty much every outing is set up for one of my boys. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it just changes over the years. The experience changes for sure. Not and, it, and it's all good. You know, every stage is good. Well, we're at the sauce stop of the of the uh, of the show. We've got about five, seven, less than ten minutes to wrap it up to stay within your your schedule, uh, Kristen. So let's talk about what the heck you do every single day at, at Peterson's Bow Hunting. Well, um, actually, that's a good question. You know how people wonder, you know, like, yeah, what does the editor of a magazine do? I kind of describe it as being a general contractor. You know, if you imagine you're doing a big construction job and you're the general contractor, right? So you're responsible for everybody else, whether they're doing the plumbing, the electrical, the foundation, uh, the landscaping, you name it. You've got to make sure that everyone is ready to do their job, you know, when it needs to be done. And that's kind of what being the editor of a magazine is like. So every year we put together a plan for our nine issues and uh, what the theme is going to be, what types of articles that we want to have, what types of products we may want to cover uh, in those issues. And then as the editor, I've got to decide whether, um, you know, I'm going to write something myself or uh, whether I'm going to assign that to somebody else staff here or we're going to hire a freelancer to do that for us um work with uh, my associate editor and my art director to gather up all the photos the illustrations that we need uh, put the pages together and then of course there's a whole bunch of folks uh you know within the industry guys who are my field editors my regular contributors people like bill winky or randy almer eddie claypool bob humphrey uh, who are working for me on a regular basis to provide various columns um, and then there's just freelancers, you know, folks who might go out and kill that big 180 or 200 inch deer. And I'll purchase articles from those folks, um, you know, about their hunts or maybe somebody who's got some particular insights in deer management or, you know, shooting your bow more effectively, more accurately. So um, basically, I guess they just pay me to sit here all day and think about the magazine and, and, and what, it, what we're going to do to to make it as good as we can to serve the bow hunters of America, hopefully, you know, not only to uh, entertain them, you know, I, I, I want people to enjoy themselves reading Peterson's bow hunting when it shows up in the mailbox or they pick the copy up at, at the Walmart or wherever. But, but as much as I want to entertain them, you know, I want to educate folks too. And so hopefully they're not just enjoying themselves, but they're learning something in the process, becoming better archers, uh, better hunters, uh, more knowledgeable about, you know, the gear that's available to them and, and, you know, some of the issues of the day that are, you know, impacting us as bow hunters, whether that be, you know, the spread of chronic wasting disease amongst our, our deer herds across the country or, you know, some regulatory, you know, battles that might be taking place in various states regarding, you know, um, what kind of equipment we can or can't use or, or that sort of thing. Well, thanks for that. And give a shout out how people can get uh, find you on the web. That's the easiest place, or just go to Walmart, pick up your magazine. But let's give some URLs and and locations because uh, I know you have numerous outlets uh, in the digital world. So let's share those with the folks. Absolutely. So if you want to uh, connect with Peterson's Bow Hunting, the best way to do that is to visit our website, which is uh, www.bowhuntingmag.com. Bowhuntingmag.com. You can also check out our uh, social media pages on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to connect with me personally, the best way to do that is uh, through social media. And you can find me uh, on Facebook and Instagram at Seabird Boat. So that's the way that people can connect with me as well. So um, what I really recommend as far as the magazine, you know, if you not read Peterson's bow hunting on a regular basis, get on the website and get yourself a subscription. For eight bucks, we're running a great special right now. Eight bucks, I think, you can get a full year of Peterson's bow hunting delivered to your mailbox. And we charge five ninety nine on the newsstand group. So I always say rather than buying one copy at Walmart, you're better off going on the website and getting a whole year for for two more 
dollars, we'll send it right to your house for the whole year. You can't beat it. Oh, you're going. Are you, were you leaving right now, Bruce, to go get it? No, <laughs> I can get it right here. I can just get it right here. <laughs> I'm sitting in my tree stand with my with my iPhone, and that that's the neat thing. What's happened with technology? You can literally, and I've done this, literally take a picture, put it on Instagram, and within an hour, you get a thousand people or more. You know, replying to you. It, it's a crazy sure. world. But I've shared, you know, look at this buck. Should I shoot him or not? Or whatever. You know, and you, you just make the post. And it's the same thing uh, that you can do from when Bill Wakey says, you're not going to believe what happened this morning. Mr. Wonderful came through and it was a big fight. He's got a video, short clip. And he yeah. puts that out. It hits Instagram and boom, it's there. And then you see it and you blow it up and you put it on, you put it on, uh, on Peterson's bow hunting. I mean, that stuff happens. That's reality, folks. That's the world oh, we live. Yeah. In. We're high tech rednecks now. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Any any final thoughts? I mean, we didn't get through half of what we we're going to talk about, but I want to be, you know, uh, cognizant of your, you know, your, your time restraints. Well, you got to be cognizant of your listeners. I mean, just putting up with us for forty five minutes is, <laughs> you know, we ought to send them all a certificate of achievement. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, listen, I'm happy to come back on any time, Bruce. Yeah, there's there's a million other things that we could talk about in the world of deer hunting, but I appreciate you having me on. It's been a pleasure. Um, hopefully, I'll make a few more good stories to share, and, and you'll do the same. And we've got to get you down there to Whitetail Heaven. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. With that, uh, on behalf of thousands of listeners throughout North America, I, I know you've hunted up in Canada. I've been blessed to hunt on uh, some of the Canadian provinces, and there's a lot of wonderful, uh, wonderful deer, big bucks. And oh, wonderful people, just wonderful people up in that neck of the woods. So uh, on behalf of everybody of the Whitetail Rendezvous tribe, just thanks so much for sharing. And I, I do look forward to, you know, reconnecting every six months or, or at least once a year to kind of recap what's what's going on in the life of, uh, of digital, uh, you know, distribution of information, as we talked about it, and how really our responsibility, just like this show, foundation is i want to educate people i want to bring people in here uh you know uh like josh honeycutt that's in his 20s he's, he's involved with realtree but he's been hunting since he's like 12 years old and then he's phenomenal deer hunter um but there's also john smith from you know dubuque iowa that smoked big deer every single year and you'll never hear about him he's off the radar oh, sure. you know well, keep doing what you're doing my friend um a lot of good information out here, and uh, I'm just honored to be uh, one of the uh, people who have made the cut to be a part of what you have going on. Thank you so much. Next up is probably, possibly, well, heck with that, folks. It, it, it just is that um, the most important uh, Whitetail Rendezvous podcast that I'm going to air in 2018, and it's with uh, Ace Luciano. And Ace is a hunter, fisherman, outdoorsman, youth mentor, writer, post writer, uh, as he is a best selling author, entrepreneur, sales ex- executive, marketing, ex- marketing expert, gun guru, seminar speaking, fundraising pro- uh, professional. Ace does a lot of things, but what he's most passionate, passionate about is our Second Amendment. And he and I are going to go in and delve into to the headlines, to CNN and ABC and NBC and Fox and everybody else that's talking about guns these days and what's at stake. So very simple. Um, if you don't listen to any other podcasts of mine the whole year, listen to Ace. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.